Fluentness. And how many of you consider yourself fluent? Okay, wonderful. Don't be shy. Yeah, exactly. So I thought, first of all, we need to define what we consider as a fluent. The clicker doesn't seem to like it. Oh, so what is a fluent speaker, right? That's important to understand. So according to Cambridge Dictionary, okay, a fluent speaker is someone who is able to speak a language easily and well. Well means correctly, right? And of course, someone can speak it with not many pauses, right? It just comes naturally, okay? So that is the definition of being a fluent speaker. And with my research and my career, so I'm very fortunate to meet quite a few fluent Mandarin speakers. So I'm gonna start with Dr. Martin Wood, who I met at University of Leeds at a international conference of East Asian languages in 2019. So initially, because he was introduced to me by a Japanese colleague of mine, because I'm the head of East Asian languages. So I thought, okay, so he's a, wonderful Japanese speaker. And then it turns out he's actually also a fluent Chinese speaker. And not only that, he's fluent in eight different languages, including Filipino, which is a big surprise to me. And then Ivo, who joined us far away from Beijing. Thank you so much for joining us, Ivo. So Ivo, originally from Bulgaria, a student of mine at NSE a few years back, and I remember him, he was already in actually quite high level uh, Mandarin classes as a non-degree extra curriculum. And I remembered him because actually when we were celebrating Chinese New Year, I remember that was the year of the rooster. So he was actually singing and playing guitar or in Chinese, it was like a wow effect of the event. And then he managed to go to Chinese government scholarship and pursue his PhD in international relations at Peking University. And now he stayed, actually live, as you can see, in Beijing and to be an academic and also entrepreneur. And then also Grant. Um, it's a funny story how I met Grant, actually. So one day I received a call from BBC saying, hey, Dr. Xiang, we have this young man from Scotland okay, managed to learn Mandarin and managed to speak it fluently within six months during lockdown. So we really want to find out more about him. So we invite him to come to BBC Radio Scotland and we would like you to come and join us. So while he was telling me about Grant, I was thinking, really? <laughs> six months, fluent, no teacher, all by himself? How did he do that? And so I was very curious about it. And I was like, sure, I do want to find out a bit more. So I agreed to it. And before that, I did a little bit Googling <laughs> because apparently I was told he was made, you know, on the school, on the newspaper. So that's the title, Peter Pig helped Edinburgh student Grant to learn to speak Mandarin. And that was Grant at the time. So there was a little video of him talking a little bit in Chinese. So I was like, Hmm, sounds quite good. And then I did then end up having a conversation with him via BBC Radio Scotland, although very brief. So we had a little chat in Mandarin. And then he joined me later in my interview, talking about his experience. Last but not least, another student of mine at LSE, Michele, originally from Italy. So he was a student of mine actually in the intermediate level at LSE, one thing really struck me about him because that was during pandemic period of time, everything was online. And usually we have a bit break, you know, Zoom break, right? All the students or most students will just turn off their camera and disappear, right? Miguel will hang around and start to have a chat with me in Chinese, okay? So he really seek opportunity to practice his, his Mandarin and also during the session, every time he has a question, he will consistently only use Chinese to ask. So I thought that's very interesting. And then at LSC, usually Mandarin degree option has five different levels. So intermediate is the second, all the way to mastery. But I just saw great potential of him. So we actually at LSC recommended him 
as our contester on behalf of NSC to join the Chinese bridge, the 20th Chinese bridge competition in the UK. And he won the most creative award. And one of the things that really, really interesting is that he managed to combine talking about his Mandarin learning experience with a bit of magic because it's so fascinating. I, I do want to show that with you. So there's a little video. <laughs> and, and it's a way to test because a lot of you are learning Mandarin. So it's a bit of listening test because he was sharing his learning journey. Okay, let's see how much you get and whether you enjoy his performance. Okay, um, so let's see. Can we reduce? It's a little bit low volume. We are sorry. Okay, sorry. We have to um, try again, and then it's just going to be accepting the volume as the well. He said he made this deck by all by himself. So now he's playing the deck. He's talked about his four skills, right? Involved in learning a language. So listening is the easiest skill for him. What's that character? Reading, right? Reading comes next. And then it's writing. He's saying speaking for him is the most difficult, just like that card is so difficult to find, right? But eventually, he managed it. Oh, still area for improvement, but He's already learning a lot. And then obviously, if you continue learning, you can do more, right? So that's the idea, okay? And that performance actually won him also the award of the most creative because he combined magic with his learning experience of Chinese. So the reason I introduced these four people to you, partly 
they inspire me to want to find out. They're all different, right? They all learn Chinese in a very different way. And so what strategies do they actually use when they start learning Chinese, right? But the other thing is they are real people, okay? And so I also have the pleasure of having them actually join me here tonight. So later we will have a bit of discussion. You also, particularly for the people who come here today, you will have the opportunity to get to know them. And of course, Ivo, very much grateful because he joined us from Beijing. Okay, so this is the first set of question. I think it's the real students and amazing learners inspire me to want to find out the strategy that they use to learn Chinese. And then I want to share just a little bit of literature. And I think we need to understand a little bit in terms of what's the difference between learning style and the learning strategy. So these two terms are very often being used together. From an educational perspective, so learning style tend to be this you know, general term, indicate a preferred or habitual pattern of mental functioning and how we deal with new information. So the nice thing about learning style is that we are all different, okay? And the learning style is not just one thing right or wrong, each of us have a preferred way to learn, and this a lot to do with our personality and even our biology. So what is interesting about learning style is that there's common traits, and there is this famous index of learning style developed in 2005, and normally we can be divided into four different dimensions. So what we call active, reflective, sensing, intuitive, visual, verbal, sequential and global. So each one of us would fall into some kind of scale, okay, across these four different dimensions. Some of it quite interesting, easy to understand, right? For example, visual and verbal. So if you're a visual learner, you love graphs, right? That help you to digest and understand the information. While if you're a verbal learner in your classroom, you would prefer to have a conversation and you would like to explain what you've learned to other people. That's the best way for you to learn. So for any of you who are curious to find out about your own style, there's a little test so you can do. And that, I think that's a quite kind of a general starting point to understand yourself. But today we are focusing on learning strategies. So strategies is more specific, okay? And particularly when we come to language learning, so strategies are the conscious steps. So you made that choice, okay? It's the conscious steps that you do or the behavior you do to help you. So there's about acquisition. So how you learn the language to storage, retain, retain the information, and as a language learner, it's of course also very important to recall, right? When you talk in the target language, you want to be able to let the word out. So this is what we're gonna focus on. The strategies consciously made, you know, the choices made by our fluent speakers. So talking about learning strategy, particularly for language learners, we also have existing literature. The most famous one was by Oxford 1990, that it's being captured into broadly these six different categories, okay? So number one, memory strategies. So as you know, learning a foreign language, your memory has to work, okay? Memory strategies is very important and typically focus on the methods that you can do to help you remember better. The second, cognitive strategies. So these are the strategies more about reasoning. How do you make sense of this language? What's the grammar structure, right? How the language work comparing to yourself? There's a lot of contrasting and try to understand how the words are formed. So all this fall into cognitive strategies. And then comprehension strategies. Imagine you're a language learner, your language skills is not that great yet. So what can you learn to understand the other person? Also enable the other person to understand you, right? So these are the strategies you can use. Metacognitive strategy. So that means more about planning your learning. How do you plan your learning to make learning more effective? Okay. And how do you keep motivated and evaluating your learning outcome? Effective strategy. I thought that's quite an interesting and a funny one. So this is address learners' emotional and the psychological state. 
So when you learn a foreign language, sometimes you might get anxious. You might think, oh, this is so hard. So this is a strategy allow you to cope, you know, mentally, emotionally, how to be a dedicated and motiv motivated learner. Finally, last but not least, very important, social strategies. So how you work with other people, how you cooperate with other people in order to be better learners. Okay, so broadly, these are the six strategy types. So that made me trigger. I mean, this is 1990, and it was very much established based on English as a foundation, right? So that made me curious also about, now we're talking about Mandarin Chinese, right? So how do Mandarin learning strategies similar or differ from this inventory? Because as we know, Mandarin Chinese is slightly different, right? So these are the two starting points and what is the key question of my research. So now let's just give you a little bit of context of my current research. So as a summary, it's a qualitative study purely focused on learner perspective, okay? And once upon a time, if you guys remember this COVID, <laughs> so um, during COVID period time, so we all moved from, you know, online, offline to online, online, offline. And the one thing that I've learned during the period of lockdown is that I've decided to do something productive rather than consuming, okay? So I want to produce something rather than consume information. And that is the reason that I started actually my own YouTube channel called Zi Espresso during COVID period of time. So I wanted to focus on morphology. So talk about the relationship between Chinese characters and words. And this is a little project, but also helped me to be able to reach out to more learners beyond just the immediate classroom setting. So there's three key themes in my channel. The first one is more about the usual theme based. So I introduce one Chinese character and they tend to be based on theme. For example, the very latest video I've done is falling to the playlist of body parts. So I was talking about R, ear. Okay, so usually what I do is I will introduce common vocabulary and Chinese idioms and sayings related to that. So the very latest expression is Er Shun Zhi Nian. Does anyone know which age is Er Shun Zhi Nian? Liu Shi Sui. Liu Shi excellent. So, but why it's called Er Shun Zhi Nian? Okay, so usually I will introduce the expression or idiom, I break it down and give you the historical and the cultural reference. So this is actually a very important saying from Confucius, how he, looking back his own life, reflecting, our Shun Zhi Nian is, means when you get to the age of 60, you should really be able to accept any criticism or anything people say to you with ease. You shouldn't get annoyed or upset. You should learn to know already how to deal with such kind of criticism at that age. And then the big part is also about the interview series. So I interviewed um, fellow teachers like myself and language learners. And more recently is the daily headline where I want to introduce something more current. So I do two pieces of news headline every day from different media like BBC, Financial Times, so that we can learn something more contemporary. So, here comes the interview that I've done with, in total, so far, 15 fluent Mandarin speakers. So the interview itself was all in Chinese. So I talked with them for about 15, 20 minutes, okay? And I asked them one key question. What are the biggest challenges that you encountered when you start learning Chinese? And how did you overcome it? Okay? And so in Chinese, we say guo lai ren, so they've been there, right? And so today I want to just share with you what I found actually through interviewing this 15 fluent speaker. So before that, I'm just very quickly tell you a little bit about the profile of these participants. In terms of gender, so 60% male, 40% female. In terms of age, so we have majority of the participants sort of younger, um, from 20 to 30, and we do have a few above 50. And then in terms of pro profession, so as you can see, there's a synergy. So the younger generation tend to be students. So it's actually a mixture of 
undergraduate, postgraduate, and PhD student. I try to put them into the same category. And then we have professionals. We also have people working in higher education like me. I, I categorize them as lecturer and then entrepreneurs. In terms of nationality, so, so far um, in my current study, we have a quite wide range. We have some of the participants, they speak English only as their primary language, like from America, Australia, British, but we also have a, quite a few European, but one uh, Vietnamese speaker, which is also interesting. Study mode, I thought that's also quite important. So how did they learn Chinese? How did they start learning Chinese? So probably no surprise, majority of them start with instruction. That means they go to a classroom, right? They got taught by a Chinese teacher, but they're also 20%. They become fluent without any teachers. They were self-taught. So I thought that's also quite interesting. And finally, I thought it's important to see what is their exposure in the authentic language environment. So you can see majority, um, about 50% of them have been to China. Usually it's like a year abroad exchange or some kind of visit. But we do have some of them have never been to China, yet become fluent, right? And then we also have people who currently live in China. So the reason I want to show you is that there's a wide range and diversity of all these learners. Despite all these differences, what they have in common is that they become fluent speaker. So just as a reminder, my question, what strategy do fluent Mandarin speakers use when they start their learning? And how do Mandarin learning strategy similar or differ from the Oxford 1990 language category? Okay, so here are my findings. First one, memory strategies. It's a very big one, okay? Um, you can see uh, here, these are the subcategory, okay? Sub strategies you can use to improve your memory when it comes to language learning. And I think one of the things being mentioned a lot is reviewing well, okay? Quite a few sp speakers talk about the importance of reviewing what they've learned. So we have this quote, I recite five new words every day. It is extremely useful to me. Also, always review. Even after your exam, you must review, review, review. So that must be a student, right? So talk about the importance. <laughs> but I think the idea of, you know, structure review has been mentioned several times. And then the next quote is really interesting to me. I was practicing Chinese characters daily. And when I wrote, I also said it out loud. I kept writing, kept pronouncing character at the same time until it formed a habit. So through that quote, we can see this speaker used a number of strategies, right? So there's the association, associate the meaning with the sound, but there's also the imagery because you have the character, you have the visual, then you also have the employing action, the last word, using mechanical technique because you're handwriting it. So it seems it's very effective, or at least for this fluent speaker, to use all the senses when they come to learn Chinese characters, listening, visual, and writing at the same time. So you, you have all these different memory strategies to help you. Cognitive strategy. So this is also interesting. This is more visible in my study mentioned by slightly older participants. And they, particularly when it comes to writing Chinese characters, they all talk about formal practicing writing system, meaning sitting down every day, write for several hours, okay? And also, one thing is quite interesting is about this um, analyzing contrastively across language. The reason I use blue is this one is actually quite controversial. So we have one Italian speaker talking about he tried, when he tried to learn Chinese at the beginning, he tried to use that because contrasting, you know, analyzing the language contrastively worked very well for him when he learned English, okay? But what, we, what he found is when it comes to Chinese, it just simply doesn't work because the language system is so different. When is the character, when is the wrong letter, he just find there's no way for him to con contrast in an effective way, okay? And then I have another 
a fluent speaker who is from Vietnam, she also made a very interesting point because as you know, Vietnamese is also a tonal language, right? So when she started to learn Chinese, obviously tone is a big thing for most Mandarin learners. So she said when she tried to contrast and compare Mandarin tone with Vietnamese tone, she found it really challenging and actually confusing. So he didn't find that contrast strategy work well for her. Instead, she find it actually much easier to learn it via English. I thought that's quite interesting. Comprehension strategy. Not so many being mentioned. By the way, the red underlined is the ones that being mentioned by uh, the participant, participants in my study. But there's a one really interesting example about how the learners adjusting the message. So I was told this story in the interview talking about during the year abroad experience. So this person went to the supermarket and want to buy some chicken. But for whatever reason, he couldn't make the shop assistant understood, understand what he wanted to buy, right? So he went, he was like, what, what do I do? What do you think he did? Then he dragged the shop assistant in front of a bag of eggs, right? And say, had a mama, okay? <laughs> Mom of the eggs. And that's how the message goes come across, right? Use limited you know, language, overcome the limitation in order to communicate, right? To make other people understand. I thought that's an amazing story. It's so fun. Um, metacognitive strategy. So we have speakers use quite a few metacognitive strategy, especially paying attention. Paying attention has been mentioned a number of times by learners, particularly when they talk about Chinese tones. So listen to how native speakers speak, uh, pay attention to how they say it and learn from that. And this will also be mentioned quite a lot, identifying the purpose of a language task. So a lot of the participants in the study, their interest might not necessarily be just learning Chinese for the sake of Chinese. Actually, they some of them are interested in Chinese history, some of them are interested in Chinese IR. So what they did is that when they identify a learning task, if they want to read something, they will pick something in the field that they are interested in, right? If they want to watch something, watch a documentary in another topic that you are interested in. So there's a very conscious de decision to plan the learning to make it more enjoyable, right? Because it's something that you feel familiar or it's more relevant to you. And I think seeking, practicing opportunity, again, that's a very big one, okay? So it kind of ranged from obviously, you can imagine I have one participant started learning Chinese in the 80s and 90s, right? So he was telling me he started learning Chinese in Italy and his Italian, lecture teacher, well, who's the Chinese teacher, has never been to China and never met a Chinese person himself. So he thought, oh, all my tones are wrong because my teacher who's Italian is a linguist, cannot really pronounce the language to me very well. And in that time, it was very difficult. You have less resources to tap into. And then he decided to go to the local Chinese restaurant in Bologna and then it turns out they were owned by people from Wenzhou who speak their own local dialect. Mm -hmm. So he has no way to practice his Chinese, okay? But nowadays it's so much easier, right? So we talk, we have people talk about they can just find a Chinese person at the tube station and start having a conversation, right? So, um, but the seeking practice opportunity or spend, you know, doing your year abroad in China is another opportunity, right? So that's a very, very big one. This is the fun bit. I find it fascinating. Um, effective strategies. So by the way, so as you can see, apparently learning a foreign language is not easy. There's a lot of anxiety. So the strategies here being discovered or identified is like lower your anxiety, right? And then kind of taking your emotional temperature and listening to your body. I mean, none of the participants in my study mentioned any of these strategies. But what they have in common is that they are all really, really passionate about learning Chinese and they really cherish the opportunity of learning Chinese and the opportunity to communicate with Chinese people. So 
you know, like learning Chinese is a privilege. To me, Chinese is the most beautiful language in the world. And another the participant say it's such a valuable thing that I can communicate with many different people. I would otherwise never be able to know their stories and perspectives. So they all say learning Chinese is challenging, but I don't feel that they need this effective strategy per se, or at least it's being not mentioned. Last one, social strategy, another very big one, okay? Um, cooperating with proficient user of the new language. So I think it's actually um, more often people talk about have the opportunity and speak with native speakers. And then, oh, and then developing cultural understanding and becoming aware of other people's thoughts has been also mentioned. The idea that when you learn Chinese, when you learn the language, you need to appreciate the Chinese way of logic, Chinese way of thinking, right? You're not thinking about, oh, I have to translate into English. Does this make sense or this doesn't make sense? You have to immerse and try to think, oh, this is the how, how Chinese people perceive the language because language in a way is the reflection of our thoughts. So just two quick things because everybody talk about learning tones are very difficult. And so what are the common strategy being used um, the first one, so this person actually, at the beginning, she was talking about she tried to listen to videos, uh, listen to teachers to teach them how to differentiate and pronounce the tones, but it wasn't very effective for her. So she then said, I only started to understand the tones after listening to quite a lot of native speakers. So she was spending a lot of time watching TV series and movies, and therefore she said, it's really important to listen to different people, old, young, male, female, okay? So you got a variety of how people speak and you should just pay attention to them. And then the second advice is more around imitation, the importance of imitation. But you can make a choice what you imitate. If you like music, you can listen to a song. If you like poetry, you can imitate a poem. But the idea is that, again, pay attention to the native speaker and imitate a Chinese person's voice. Chinese characters. I guess there's not much good news here <laughs> because uh, you can see there's a lot of memory strategies being used. I spent hours daily to write Chinese characters. I wrote a, a lot of Chinese characters every day, but I thought that one is also interesting. I learned about the origin of each word and how the Chinese, how the characters form words. For me, this is very interesting and I understand better with time. So I think that is like breaking down, right? A cognitive strategy to appreciate the language better. So just as a summary of the key findings and the implication, so we can see the memory strategy and social strategies tend to be the two dominant strategies used by fluent speakers, okay? In terms of general fluency, and in addition, I think because of the nature of the Chinese characters, we need to have a combination of different memory strategies. So all the sub-strategies can help you. And then cognitive and the metacognitive strategies are very relevant and useful when it comes to learning the tones and Chinese characters. Effective strategy doesn't seem to apply to the participants in this study, but it does really clear to me all participants demonstrate passion for Chinese language. And also they were really interested at at least one aspect, whether Chinese culture, history or society or philosophy, right? The last point, age and the learning environment seemed to have an impact on the focus and the strategies learner adopt. I think it's not difficult to imagine that with the younger, learners or fluent speakers, they will be talking about more in terms of using software and, you know, build on the technology to learn, while we have the sort of more slightly elder generation will be more relying on sort of memory strategy and cognitive strategy. So they have a slightly different shift. But nonetheless, I think this is my key message to everyone who's learning Chinese provided sufficient input, motivation, and suitable learning strategies, any learner can develop fluency 
regardless of learning mode. So whether you're learning by yourself, you have an instruct instructor, what is important is sufficient input motivation and a strategy that works for you, right? So I want to end by give you the top tips from Guo Lai Ren. So that is a combination from all the speakers that I interviewed, but also from myself as a language educator. Okay, so I think the first one is most important, the authenticity. Um, I think that has three different layers. Okay, so first you need to be the authentic yourself. You need to understand why you want to learn language and what really interests you. Because if you know that, you can make the language more learning more relevant and more fun. And the second is about using authentic materials as much as possible, because that's the genuine way Chinese people talk. That's the genuine way Chinese people write. You need to get into that. And the final lay, the authentic communicative opportunities. Again, it's about talk with a real Chinese person, right? So then you understand, oh, sometimes, you know, you make some mistakes, but that's how you learn. So that is really, really important. And then in terms of actual practicality, so review, preview, daily practice. So, you know, next time if we, we have time, we can talk a little bit more about actually memory, how memory works and what kind of practice, what kind of, you know, uh, space you should give yourself to enhance your memory. And this too, I put time three because it's been mentioned over and over, be patient and perseverance. So, you know, you just have to have the right attitude when you come to learn Chinese. And finally, I agree 100%, adopt Chinese ways of thinking, right? To put yourself, immerse yourself in the language and in the way this language is conveyed. So it's kind of a little, you know, cycle. So that obviously these are the tips from some people and, you know, I'm pretty sure one day you will also have developed strategy and tips you can share with everyone else. So um, feel free to check out my um, channel and all the interviews, as I mentioned, they were done in Mandarin Chinese, but it has English subtitles. So if you want to hear the original idea from these speakers, you can watch the playlist. It's called Guo Lai Ren, right? So being there and done that. And the best way to connect with me is via LinkedIn because I tend to use LinkedIn more on a more regular basis. So I hope I'm actually on time. Yes. Okay, that's great. So now if I can have the pleasure to in, invite all the guest speakers or the panelists to join me here. Okay, so, um, so let me just first introduce all the um, speakers and then, uh, by the way, we're gonna switch to Chinese, okay? So um, it's an opportunity for some listening, but also they are fluent speakers. They have to have the stage to show, show their language skills, okay? So um, first I'm gonna introduce Grant, Grant Swasson. So he's a self-taught Mandarin speaker from Highlands of Scotland. He studied, he started his Chinese language learning journey while also studying a degree in robotics and uh, automated system. That's why I was so impressed. It's like miles away from language learning. Um, during the COVID lockdown period in UK, he quickly progressed to a conversational level. He's an advocate for language learning through immersion, along with based repetition flashcards and the sentence mining for vocabulary and grammar. He appeared on my podcast Guo Lai Ren in summer 2021. And since then he has lived in Taiwan and using his Chinese in a professional capacity as a sales engineer. And he will soon return to Taiwan as a Taiwan regional sales director. By the way, this is the first time I actually met Grant in person. So, so nice to meet you face to face. My pleasure. And then Dr. Martin Wood. Um, so he's an associate professor of Chinese and Japanese translation at the University of Leeds. He graduated from University of Leeds with a BA in Chinese and Japanese studies, and then get, gained an 
ED and a PhD in Asian culture from Hiroshima University in Japan. And then he translated a number of China related books, including a collection of over 1,100 wartime Japanese, Japanese military documents published as Insight into Japanese Imperialism and the Communist Party of China, a Concise History. He is the founder of the now expansion East Asian Translation Pedagogy Advanced Network and also joint chief editor of the language scholar journal hosted by the Center for Excellence in Language Teaching at University of Leeds. So thank you for coming today you know, from Leeds to join us. And then Miguel and Maggie uh, comes from Osti, a small town in Piemont, Italy, beautiful place. <laughs> Currently study an MSc in finance at LSE. And he started learning Mandarin Chinese during COVID lockdown. And it immediately became a passion and he kept cultivating throughout his undergraduate studies. He participated in the UK regional final of the 20th Chinese Bridge Chinese Proficiency Competition winning an award for the most creative use of language. He also collaborated with a few companies in the production of video content in Mandarin and was a guest speaker at the 2021 Holman Dialogue that's organized by the PKU HSB's business school representing LSE. Last but not least, hi Ivo. Uh, so Ivo Genjev is a Beijing-based executive, academic and a consultant. He currently served as a global partner at Top Brand Union, vice chairman of the Bulgaria China Com Chamber of Commerce and the founding director of the Center for Regional Integration. He has previously taught at Queen Mary University of London, Newcastle University and Beijing Union University. Evo's academic work has appeared in leading peer-reviewed journals such as Strategic Analysis, World Affair and International Studies, he holds a PhD from PK University, MSc from London School of Economics, and, and, and a BA from Newcastle University, as well as wide, world, worldwide recognized tutor status from University of London. In his free time, he enjoys play, playing rock music <laughs> and also learn languages. So he's got Chinese, French, Russian, Spanish, and Bulgarian under his belt. So welcome everyone, and Ivo again, thank you so much for joining us from Beijing. 好的,那因为我觉得这个是用中文会比较有趣 你们的生活中有什么新的有趣的事情可以跟大家分享你们最近有什么新的动态 呃，然后从那个时候到现在，呃，有好几个这个进展。一个是我参加了一个公司叫饼拜联盟，这个公司本来那个董事长是我的一个朋友，然后他就想找一些这个海外的专家，这个参加他的一些活动。呃，后来
呃，这个这个一个事情。啊、呃，然后我也在写一本书啊、呃，所以这个五月份得给这个出版社这个稿子，呃，所以这个现在的事情有可能呃比较多，呃，差不多我现在做的就是这些事情，然后以后希望有机会夏天过来伦敦一趟。啊，一博，你真的是太忙了，你的书叫什么名字？新书叫什么名字？呃，那个，他就是关于拉丁美洲的一句话，呃，这个名字很长。好的， So what did you guys get? So he started since last interview, started the company, started the TV show, start writing a book, and what what's the thing I oh started the center of uh something called global inter integration, regional regional, 对，很忙，大忙人 ，busy guy. Okay, 谢谢 Okay. 呃，哇，你的中文厉害哦！我今天比不上。呃，自从我在过来人上呃出现之后，呃，虽然只有两年的时间，可是感觉到是比较长的时间。对，我也觉得。对、okay. ，因为我的生活中发生了很多变化。呃，我觉得我上次跟你聊天以后，我就去台湾了。我在台湾，我在海大的语言中心学了一年的中文。呃，然后。我唯一在苏格兰的公司做他们的销售啊 ，OK。然后在台湾当销售的那段时间是很厉害的，因为我的工作让我就是随便去群岛呃出差，然后可以顺便旅行。<笑>呃、你去了哪些地方？呃，我去了新竹、高雄、台中、台南，嗯、好多地方，嗯，好多地方对。呃，然后还有一个新消息是，我在台湾跟我女朋友认识。啊、oh, ，他是他是哪里人？他是印尼人。哎，印尼人。但是他的祖先是从福建来的。福建啊，他算是个华裔吧？算华裔啊、嗯。呃，所以我们两个，因为我们常常讲中文，嗯、我觉得就是让我的口语突飞猛进。<笑>所以，所以有一个中国女朋友很重要。嗯、uh, ，So went back to Tai Taiwan, right? Improved Chinese, got a job, also. On the girlfriend, <laughs> what can be better than that? Okay, excellent. How the party? Ah, 谢谢大家好啊。呃，那从上次我们讨论那个大概是二零二零年，对，或者二零二一年，我也不记得。对。但是当然是在这个 lockdown 当中，我就是在家里教书，就是跟大家一样上网教课，所以那个那个就继续一段时间，一边教课，然后就是继续这个翻译的项目。比如说你刚刚介绍的这个，呃，战争时代的这个日本的这些军队的一些呃东西，我我办完那个项目大概两年半，呃，花的时间来翻译，然后就开始办不同的东西。比如说我今天也带来这一本，这个是这个二零二一年那个共中国共产党的那个一百一百周年，对，他们。啊、uh, ，就出版这个中文的这本书，然后就要这个翻译这个出版社 A C A Publishing 就是翻译这本书，所以我参加这个项目就翻了两张啊， uh, 所以然后后面后来还有啊、uh, 翻译不同的这这种类的一些，这种类型还还没有还没有出版的，但是对我就呃一边忙着找课，一边忙忙这个翻译的的的工作。嗯，很期待下次看看你的那个。所以 Martin 跟我一样 ，because we both teach, right? So a lot of teaching during pandemic, but because he's very much involved in translation, so as we see, he's been translated one book and then、uh, another contribution to the chapter in this particular book. Continue to work on a range of translation、um, projects. Okay, we get it. 从从过不是过来过来人了，嗯，过来人，对对对。从从过来看看之后，其实没有什么大<笑>大变化。我从本科呃毕业了，开始也就读我的金融硕士生，然后然后然后开始我的职业生涯。嗯，所以在学习和申请。实习和工作之间，学习中文的时间真的变少了，变少了啊，越来越越越来越少。<笑>所以，只要保持着我中文水平的话，我希望不要退步的太多。嗯嗯嗯。不过，有不过，我在累积学习经历的过程中，我认识了很多同样在学中文的人。
也偶尔被邀请参加不同的活动，所以我想说的是，练习中文的机会也也不少。对对，所以从你的角度是要能够维持，能够维持中文。嗯、so Miguel, I mean, graduate from master, uh, bachelor degree, right? At LSE, and now he's doing a master. So you say, obviously, very busy with study. It's not easy to do a master in finance at LSE. Um, but obviously, for him, is trying to find opportunity to keep up practicing Chinese. Okay, 很好。那第二个我就是其实想说的就是，其实跟 Miguel 刚才说的也是有关系的。因为呃，我们虽然是不同的人，他们也是在不同的阶段 ，so they are also at different stage, right? In terms of fluency and you know use of Chinese. 所以我其实就是想问问他们，即便他们已经那么好了，对不对？即便他们的中文已经很已经很好了，那他们有没有其他的方式，或者说怎么样保持，怎么样继续提高他们的中文 ？So the question around how do you maintain, how do you continue to improve? Your Chinese, okay, Grant. So you have something. Uh, actually, there is another news I have not said. Oh, news. Okay. Uh, I I just got a new job. Hmm. So recently, I actually didn't have too much time to study. Hmm. So I just practice to learn. But I think, in my daily life, I often use Chinese. Whether it's to talk with my friends or 听播客、看电视，或者上班的时候也要求我用，呃，就是特别专业的中文，呃，所以我觉得从这些方面，我就是我的中文还是我的中文水平是越来越高的。嗯、呃，对。可是我不知道算不算是就是认真的学习。嗯，没有坐下来，然后看电脑，然后复习闪卡系统或者对，因为你的环境已经让你在不断的用、不断的使用、不断的。这是我的生活，就是你的生活。但你刚才提到工作，工作中是什么样的使用？现在到什么样的一个程度？呃，我其实我刚刚开始，可是我在台湾的时候，我会负责，呃，就是全台湾的市场，我负责就是跟客户会议，然后呃管理他们的。的那个账户，然后做一些，对，就是就是管理台湾的市场。对，但所以你也学了繁体字。学了繁体字。学了繁体字。其实，呃，我上次跟你讲话之后，我的简体字是比较好的。可是现在的话，我简体字都不认识。简体字都不会了。对。So、we'll talk about, um, so obviously, um, Grant is gonna go back to Taiwan, right, with a new job. So it's naturally gonna be part of his life, right? And also by working as a now a new job sales regional sales director, so there's a lot of daily conversation with client. And one interesting thing we talked about last time when we had the interview, he was very good with uh with simplifying Chinese character, and now he's already super good with traditional and forgot cannot recognize any simplified Chinese characters anymore. Not anymore, but just a little bit less. Good. Okay, Martin. 你的，因为你的水平，因为你已经在做翻译了，这、就是一个非常高的水平了。嗯、你觉得你现在有没有刻意的，或者说你还没有有没有什么保持自己的水平或者提高的、嗯？对，就是刚刚，因为就是跟你刚刚说的有关系，就是需要这个环境，嗯，让你来保持这你的这个水平。嗯、因为我我自己当然现在没有时间去。专门去学习中文，但是因为工作的这个环境也是让我继续使用保持这个程度、嗯，所以我就是照这个日英翻译，然后这个呃中英翻译，每一个星期都要叫一些，无论是中国来的学生来读这个硕士啊，或者是英国学生、欧洲学生在念这个学部生这个 undergraduate 的这个项目，就是叫他们翻译，所以我常常要找新的资料。叫他们报，怎么报某某的文件翻成英文，所以这个就是也让我继续自己去理解这个文件这个语法啊什么的。然后，呃，口语的话就是跟，比如说我们大学的中文老师常常聊天，对对，有这个环境就让我可以报。嗯，所以，嗯 ，So Martin was talking about in terms of。You know, work itself also helped, right? Because he has to do a lot of translation, so he will be deliberately searching for different type of material to translate. And through doing the translation work, naturally, it will help him to maintain the level, but also increase. And in terms of speaking, we'll grab Chinese colleagues to practice. 
And Miguel, I think you mentioned, um, 你说的跟中国朋友，对吧？和还有跟其他、嗯、呃会说中文的人说话。对，现在我嗯，没有时间。现在已经到了回家，还是我不学了。<笑>但是这个这个并不意味着我我我不练习啊。嗯嗯嗯，就是。对我开我我我开始学中文的时候，我后来很长时间呢背句子、背单词、背汉字什么的。现在呢，现在我就是就是利用任任何机会与说中文的人来沟通、来交流什么的，就是。对，嗯，就是比较耳濡目染的，<笑>对，耳濡目染的过程。So it's more kind of a kind of a more natural and easygoing approach because he wouldn't have time to dedicate specifically, right, to learn Chinese, but will still keep in practice. 那伊波，你在北京，那更更没得说了。天天天天出门都是中国人。啊、uh, ，你觉得你觉得你的汉语还可以进步吗？<笑>我觉得跟大家说的，我我我个人的经验跟大家说的也有很多的共同点。最早肯定我跟大家一样都是这个学生，后来呢，第二个阶段我也做了一点翻译、啊，跟那个马尔丁亨一样，我翻译了这本书啊，我那个时候当了这个中国的一个这个出版社的这个翻译啊，然后那个时候呢，我就是就不得不得。一个一个字都得查，因为要不然就反映不出来。后来呢，我开始做这个中国对外政策的研究，所以呢，呃，那个时候也是就是慢慢的查字，但是是为了一个目的，就是有一个理由，我最后得做出来一个研究，所以我把那些这个呃中文的材料当做一个就是呃一个一个一个一个参考文献。呃，之类的。然后呢，最后呢，我现在这个阶段基本上是没有什么时间，慢慢的插着这个学习。我必须得就是跟客户交流，我必须得就是呃，事实呃，就是能了解他他他在说什么。呃，还有呢，我每天都得看那个听一下我这个中国这个国家的这个领导人说什么，然后我把那个公司这个战略跟他们的。呃，说了一些大的目标，就是调整成一致的，就是比如这个两天前中国外交部的部长就说了，必须得这个呃，这个这个这个这个呃，有更多的这个呃话语权。所以呢，我们昨天还跟客户说了，我们也会帮你的公司提高你们的这个话语权。所以呢，我们现在是不断的就是。呃，每一天都都都都看、啊、这个呃新闻，都用这个呃新学的这个字，呃，基本上是这个情况。OK， 很好，这个很有意思。所以，嗯、um, ，So obviously, Evo mentioned he started his own business, right? So one of the key things is to understand the, you know, local and national policy and how that could potentially support his business and how he would. Communicate with his clients, so including learning new vocabulary or relevant vocabulary like five trend, right? So he will learn that and he will apply that in his own business context. So that is how he can learn. So because of time, and we will have some food and drink outside. So I just want to ask one final question, the final thoughts, any sort of, you know. Um, I, I kind of summarize some of the tips, right? So, just anything from you that you feel will be relevant and useful for our audience here as well as online. Just a couple of final remarks, then we can open up for questions. Who would like to go first? Who <laughs> will I? Okay, how? Uh, I think in your in your that last sentence, you said. 那个你说什么？就是 the more input,、嗯、the better you have. Sufficient input, sufficient yeah. Sufficient input, yeah. 呃，我觉得这个很对，因为我觉得大家都有自己的方法，就是学习方法，然后大家都有对哪种方法最有效，有自己的看法。嗯、呃，我也有我自己的看法，但是我觉得这并不是最重要的事情。可能最重要的事情呢，就是你花多长时间在学习中文上。嗯。呃所以，如果你花更多时间，呃，就是听播客或者听母语者讲话，呃，然后自己讲话，当然你的口音就会变好，变得好。然后
，如果你复习一些书籍的内容，或者看呃闪卡系统，那么你的词汇量就会提高。嗯，呃，可是基本上就是你画在中文上的时间越多，你就会变得越好。嗯,嗯 ，OK， so talk about importance of input, right? And talk about the portion that how much time you invest, how much result you're gonna get. Okay, very good. Other, um, Miguel. Yeah, 我的我的建议只是只是挺像的。不不，我的建议只是如如果你想成功的学习美院的话，你必须付出努力，这是不能妥协的。怎么怎么怎怎么怎么说呢？ Suck. <laughs> it's okay. 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 It's 但是，无论你的喜好，沉沉浸在语言环境中是最重要的。嗯，如如果，嗯，我我的意思是说，中文必须成为你生活中不可或缺的一部分，以以至于你开始不停的用中文和自己自言自语。呃。<笑><笑>真的，我不太敢玩笑，我是真的这样的。然后，然后开始在脑海，在脑海里用中文构思句子，然后最终用中文来思考，这个这个非常这个非常非常重要。是，然后就是继续继续练习，继续努力。OK， 努力。So keep practicing, and if you don't have anyone to talk to, even talk to yourself helps. Right in Chinese, uh, and the immersion, the importance of immersion, and okay, very good. And thinking Chinese, that's another thing. Um, Martin, Evo, anyone? 我还加上，我我我我很同意刚刚两位刚刚说的，完全是这样子。然后我可能算是属于那那个。啊，第二十世纪不是第二十一世纪的学习方法，就是二十世纪的学习方法。我知道现在有很多很方便的软软件，无论是在手机上啊、电脑上的，都有很非常有用的。但是呢，呃，在这个时代，我们就是比较期待一个你要一个东西，你明天就可以拿到。比如说 Amazon Prime， 我就想我要买东西，那个东西明天一定要到的才行啊。但是呢，学习语言这样子。不是不是这种的一件事情 ，OK， 所以我觉得让这个 app 啊什么的有用，但是不能来代替你真的认真去学习。所以我可能看到我自己说说的一些东西，在刚才这个演唱当中，就是说天天花很多时间来写字，然后说出来说写字写写写，我还记得，我觉得反正需要付出努力，需要时间，需要环境，对，不能说。今天开始，明天留力，没有这种事情，要认真。嗯、so time, effort, environment, all the combination of the three, and don't think about like get rich quick. That scheme doesn't apply to learn Chinese either. Uh, even final words. 对我，我也跟大家同意。然后 Martin 刚刚说的也很对。我们现在有各种材料，呃，就是包括就是线上的那些节目啊、博客什么的，都是学习材料。你可以不断的，就是看一些你自己感兴趣的，呃，东西啊。然后关于这个，呃，汉字，我觉得这个得思考一下，你到底是不是需要，就是非常，就是。有深度的，就是了解这个每一个字，还是你只是就是需要就是用电脑打字的，因为这个有可能得费很多的时间，呃，学好怎么手写这些字，呃，这个肯定每个人有不同的这个需求吧，呃，但是如果你只是在生活中来用中文的话，我觉得你有可能也没必要就是花那么多的时间手写，你就了解这个每一个字的这个。逻辑，这个每个部分是代表什么就，就就基本上够了。呃，然后当当然最后也就最重要的肯定是你来挑战自己啊，呃，有一个理由学习啊，给自己定目标，然后就不断的呃继续努力。
<laughs> okay, so um, so talk about uh, a choice, right? It depends on your needs of learning Mandarin. So obviously, handwriting Chinese characters can be really time consuming. So is there a question mark? Is it relevant to you? How do you you know keep Spend your time wisely, you know, improve the skill that you need the most. Unfortunately, currently LSE students don't have that choice. They have to learn to write Chinese characters. I do agree. I think we are moving on. So one day, if the moment LSE will introduce online exam, I will go for it for Chinese. There's no point of handwriting. Um, and then the last thing was also talk about perseverance and working hard, keep going. And I think that's you know, very much endorsed by everybody. So I think we are ready for Q and A. And if you have any comments or questions, you can direct your question to one of the panelists, or you can direct a question to all of us. So it's up to you. And just say your name and say your question. I do notice a comment say there's no woman. I did think about <laughs> that. Uh, unfortunately, I did reach out to female participants in my study. Unfortunately, you know, logistic reason, people are not available. So I'm still very grateful. But yeah, that's the reason. Um, any questions from online and also from our audience? So maybe we pick the one from online first, yeah. just because, you know, later you guys have the opportunity to mingle a little bit yeah yeah we have an audience uh, nadia um online asking what are the some common uh, challenges that english speakers face when learning mandarin and how can this be overcome so english speakers well <laughs> so the... nadia is also the <laughs> so, would you like to answer that first? It could be uh, your girlfriend, yes. So, because it's specifically talk about English speakers. So, what are the challenges English speakers face and how, how can these be overcome? Probably, well, the most obvious one is, of course, that English does not have any tones. Mm. So this is probably the hardest thing to learn uh, when you're just beginning. Mm -hmm. And for me, something that I found really useful, and I think I actually still do it to this day, is like I'm kind of imagining the, the like the pinion graph, the 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 tone graph, and if it's a first tone, then I'm like I'm just imagining the word is up here, or it's okay. up. and it's almost subconscious now. But I think I still do it somewhere subconsciously. Uh, but this is probably the biggest challenge I think English faces, uh, English users will face when they start learning Chinese. Okay, so kind of somehow visualize it and then help you to kind of pitch the pronunciation. For me, for me that helps, yeah. Okay. Like if I'm saying like ni hao, in my head I'm seeing like ni hao. Like okay, little, okay. I think honestly, yeah, I still see that. Okay. Um, anything to add from your perspective? Yeah, I would add something, but maybe not in the preliminary stages mm -hmm. of learning the language, but maybe a little bit later sure, on when we're, right. yeah. when we're trying to produce the language ourselves, mm -hmm. whether written or particularly written language. Uh, one of the dangers is that we start to write in Chinese as we would write in English. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the relationship, the way that Chinese expresses logic is, a, is tends to be a lot more implicit than English, which is more explicit. So, so getting to write in a in a Chinese way rather than writing something that really looks like <laughs> it was English, literally, you know, translated into Chinese. So, learning how the logic works and where you need to make those connections. So, yeah, that's that's one thing I would say. Great. So, for those of you who've done the intercultural communication, so you know that indirect, right, and the ambiguity in the language is different. So Chinese tend to be more indirect and more implicit. Well, relatively speaking, English is more explicit. So when you get to a level, you need to understand the style. Okay, very good. Yes, it is Nadi. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Do we have any other questions online? Because if not, we can yeah, we open can. to the audience here. Any questions? Yes, George. Uh, George, uh, the one Guan Yu, uh, Ji Li, Li Luan, um, or Arshin Yen Yichen, Shell, uh, Juman, are, uh, Jimmy Chen, or Fashin, uh, Yo, Tui Chen Sing the Hanzi, symmetrical characters, 
比较容易写出来，嗯，而不对称性的 asymmetrical 很难想想想想出来怎么怎么写。有没有什么可能 ？Martin 或呃和 Kevin， 呃，你们有没有见过什么理论解释这个现象 ？Okay, so we explain the question. The question is more about memory, right? So um, George studied Chinese 20 years ago. You can see he's fluent. He was talking about recently, he noticed cer certain Chinese characters he can remember, particularly the symmetrical ones. Mm. But then the other type of the character, for some reason, he found it a bit harder to recall, right? So he was asking if there's any theory or any you know, kind of science behind it can explain that. Anyone want to have a go? So I, I can comment briefly on that. Uh, so <laughs> I think, so our memory has two types. One is what we call storage memory, okay? And the other type is called retrieve memory. So Storage memory, it's the information is constantly there. So like your childhood memory, right? You might not need to remember it, but it's there. Retrieve memory, it can be, I just literally introduced Grant to you. You can now think about his name. He, you, you know it because it's retrieved high, but next day, tomorrow morning, you might forget. Yeah. So the idea of imagine how it works is that you go to a party, imagine you have all the people in your life ever you've met, they were there. So your, your mom and dad at that party will be storage high, retrieve high, right? But your school teacher will be storage high because you can recognize that's your school teacher, but somehow the name didn't come to you. So retrieve low, right? And Someone I just introduced to you, it will be storage low, retrieve high, because immediately you can remember their name, but next day you might not remember. And if there's ever a delivery man ever appear in your life, it's storage low and retrieve low, because you, you, know, you just forget. So what this tells us in your particular situation, so this particular type of character tend to be retrieve low. And the reason for retrieve low, so the retrieve storage or memory become low, a lot of times is maybe, maybe, yeah, because I don't know exactly what characters you were referring to. Most commonly, it's just simply you're not using them as often as the other characters, or they are not relevant to you. So you have less opportunity to retrieve it. And that could be the reason behind why certain memory it will just come it will just become harder there's a lot about how frequently you will come across this and how relevant these memories are for you because your brain is filtering all the time but i i, I don't know because i don't know exactly which characters you were talking about so why why you uh <laughs> but not so many characters are like that. But you know, I can't explain specifics, but, but usually it's it's more about the frequency and relevance and usefulness to you. And that will make it a lot easier to trigger the retrieve memory. Uh, <laughs> um, any other questions from the audience? Yes, Will. Um, so my question is more like, um, like as you may know, like Chinese has like quite a difficult learning curve. Like the first part is not, it's pretty hard, but like I think when you mm. get to like the further stage, it gets really hard like when there's like a lot of homophones and stuff. So I just wanted to ask like, what did you think about to help you like motivate yourself to get through that part and then really like get to the part where it gets easier? <laughs> okay, is there a kind of a phase basically? You kind of went through the original hurdle, but then you feel it's slightly stuck because it's getting a bit challenging. And then there will be a tipping point. So where's the, 
face for you before the tipping point and how did you overcome that? Martin. Um, when you feel like it's getting really hard, that's the time to get on the plane and go there. <laughs> that's a good point, yes. Because I did my first year at Leeds and then I went off on my year abroad. My first year of studying 900 characters and feeling like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. This is just, and then I went and I got in the environment. I heard it all the time. I came back after my year abroad. I thought, hmm, this feels normal. Mm -hmm. So it, it won't be the same for everyone. It depends the structure of your learning. But for me, it was when you get to buy a ticket and, go <laughs> there and, and stay there. And yeah, that, that might be, if you can do that, help the timing. Okay, good. And then there's a, a follow-up question, you know, on what Martin just say. Like, how do you approach to those Chinese strangers, like, you know, to overcome the okay. awkwardness when you're trying to find a practice opportunity? Um, Any tips okay. on that? Yeah, we get it? Um, two things. Uh, one, uh, if just the main thing would you just go for it, don't care about it. <laughs> it might be embarrassing, you might make a mistake, but who cares if it's a stranger, you're never going to see him again. <laughs> Secondly, which would be more advisable, I think, uh, there are so many apps online uh, where you can meet uh, Chinese people that, wa that want to learn English. Uh, this is how I started. Uh, mm -hmm. I just met people and, sp and uh, spoke with them from day, from, uh, day one. I couldn't speak, uh, just trying. Uh, it was very bad, but still. I, I, I had practiced speaking since since, uh, since day one. And this app, they're just really effective. They want to learn English. You want to learn Chinese. You help each other how, half an hour a day through a, through a phone call. Uh, and you can find 20, 30 language partners a day. Some of them, you might talk with them once and then never talk with them again. Uh, others, uh, I still have some of, the, some of them to this day that, are, that I'm still friends with. We don't talk on a daily basis anymore, but once in a while we catch up mm. and we have never met in real, in, uh, real life. Okay, so to have a little bit of carefree attitude, right? Mm -hmm. And then also use alternative approach. If it's face-to-face -face become a bit too much, mm -hmm. you can use online option. Um, anything other, yes? I mean, I suppose it's hard if you're in this country, but I'm thinking if you're in China and you're thinking, how can I meet people? I can't just pull random people on the streets and talk to me. <laughs> Go into a shop as if you're going to buy something, start asking questions about products, and, and that may be a more natural scenario, mm. less awkward for you. They may also come over to you and say, hey, should I go menu? You know, <laughs> what you want? And then, uh, and yeah. Might and help. by the way, our students, when they spend their time in China a year abroad, they always say they have the best conversation in a taxi, mm -hmm. right? So it's a natural place to strike off a conversation. Um, Ivo, anything you want to add on that? Yeah, I mean, there. well, I've kind of become an expert at meeting people in different places just because we have to travel. So one thing that our company does is we organize events in different cities um, and the provincial governments are our clients, basically. Uh, so they want to, you know, show that they um, are doing, you know, great things and accounting for them in front of the sort of higher authority. So they hire us. So we do the event. So then they can report that they did an event, et cetera. So basically what this means is that we have to travel a lot and obviously uh sometimes i just want to you know meet and see who's there and sometimes we just need people that we want to sort of invite to the event so we might need people that work in a certain area or sector so it's a part of the job also to go and meet people so one thing that i've started doing is as soon as i get to this to a city before i get there even um i look through my wechat groups and see who's there already or if i don't have any wechat groups with people from that place um i just try to get into groups with like maybe expats or people that just live there and you can get into them easily so there are um things on wechat like uh it's called one tube i think it's like a company that charges you like 50 or mmb to get into different groups and then you can get 500 people from you know a certain city or whatever then you start adding them one by one and then uh sooner or later with meaning within a few hours, once you just keep clicking, you're going to figure out that these people, some of them have been there for 20 years and they organize events or things like that or dinners. Uh, for example, when I was in Changsha, there was an Italian uh, couple that uh, does events every week. So they do dinners and they're partnering with a Brazilian restaurant. And because they're trying to promote their international cuisine, all the local Chinese people go there um, to try it. 
So basically, it's just a way to socialize, um, and you can do it even before you get to a place. So you know, right now, if I know that I'm going to, I don't know, like a random place uh, in China that's small, let's say um, Suzhou or something, right? Even before I go there, I could already arrange things to do, um, and that makes it a lot easier. But then again, that's if you're, you know, in China. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, maybe one last question. So it's let me just explain the question so making sure everyone understands. So we have a great student from SOS, uh, also fluent already study Chinese for three years. So she's also from Italy. So this is a question probably for people who who's not a native English speaker, right? But learning, uh, you already have your native language, you are learning Chinese. So the question is, are you learning it directly from Italian, your native language, or you're learning it through English? So, yeah. Or by English? Or yeah, English, in, uh, in English, yes, yes. It's just making sure everyone can. Yeah, happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so in terms of what language that I use, the now i'm it was mainly from english uh, but not really because i studied chinese from chinese sort of uh, i because i'm i study chinese by memorizing sentences uh, and then and that's one side of the sentence uh, i would have the translation next to it uh, but then once I memorize uh, a lot of sentences i will start combining them uh, directly from chinese to chinese uh, so there is so there is, so since I started speaking since the very since the very first day, I don't really go through a lot of thinking in English mm -hmm. or in Italian and then translating into 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 Chinese. The, the Chinese sentence would come to mind immediately. Having said that, uh, some of the Italian uh, grammar structures uh, could be more useful uh, to uh, to understand to understand the Chinese. Uh, really, compared to English. We do this to some some of them. Yes, the. Grammar, grammar, like verb tenses, masculine, feminine, plural, that not at all because their Chinese is none of them and English is more similar. But in terms of how, um, of, I would say culture and how the culture gets into the, gets into the language, Italian is much closer to, to Chinese than English is. Okay, cool. Um, Ivo, I wondered whether you want to add a little bit because obviously you're, you're also, you know, um, when you learn yeah. the English. I mean, what? I, I I try to I mean at the beginning I don't really I don't really know that I, that's not the way that I, I think about languages because I don't really translate things in my I, I'm a very bad translator the fact that I worked as a translator is actually kind of a miracle because I'm an awful translator but when I think about uh, the way that I'm saying something, I just try to think of it in the language that I'm speaking, because otherwise it comes across usually as sort of very weird or more difficult to understand. So at the beginning, what I was doing is I was just um, constantly watching uh, silly Chinese shows. Um, so back then, one thing that I found very sort of uh, helpful from a Chinese was to watch dating shows because every person does a self-introduction and every five minutes you hear somebody introducing themselves and, and you know telling the basic stuff and then later i started watching sort of chinese dramas which some of them had you know fairly simple plots that you can follow um and i just started copying what people were saying and doing so it's mostly i kind of learn languages like a little kid i just copy um i don't really think about you know i try to associate it with the actual the words with the objects or the words with the ideas not with with uh, sort of words in another language that if that makes sense. Mm, so in a way, it's a bit similar, yeah, it's right? Similar. Trying yeah. to dive in the language directly. Okay, that's the impression. Also, um, yeah. I could just add, I think um, the more that you end up listening to native uh, speakers speaking, 
rather than like memorizing certain words and then building your own sentence based on those words, you're more likely to end up then using your native language's grammar. And it will sound either incorrect or like Martin said, it's like you could tell if a, if a Chinese sentence is very Englishy. Mm -hmm. you know? um, but once you like start to build up like set phrases, Yes. Like you just, you just, uh, I don't know, like woman's all about. It's like mm. one phrase. Yeah. I don't think of each word individually. Yes. And then once you end up building these building blocks, now you can start to construct sentences based on like very natural phrases that you hear all the time. Yes. And then your language becomes far more natural because of that. I do agree to that. That's how I learn other languages. <laughs> and I can manage, impress, you know, people from different places thinking, oh, you're expert. No, but I can say a few expressions very well. So I can like, <laughs> fool them thinking I'm fluent in the language, but I'm not. Um, because of time, um, as I said, because we have a networking reception. So I just want to take the opportunity to thank all my wonderful panelists so much. Thank you so much for joining me. And also thank you so much, Ivo, particularly join us from Beijing. Can we give them a round? the online audience as well for joining us and everybody here. So we can now go and enjoy some food and drink. Um, I do some, we have some small gifts to the panelists. Evo, as I said, I take you out for dinner in Beijing. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to it. Thank you for doing everything. Yes. 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 Y